disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Despite what wisdoms were passed down to you by your elders, no matter what you have been told by your peers, regardless of what your gut reaction may be, and in complete juxtapose to what you saw in the evening news, the world in which we live is neither logical nor is it rational. You are, as the uh, best interpretation of our audience survey indicates, a human being. Woohoo! An animal <laughs> with one foot on the train of sentient thought and the other irrevocably stuck in an evolutionary gene pool. Instead of a shining society of crystal clear certainty and irrefutable logic, we have built a global empire founded largely on reactionary animal instinct. Instinct that was once crucial to our survival. Now instrumental in our perpetual perpetuation of nonsense. And while we have little hope of escaping the irrational transition state of enlightened animal anytime soon, we can at least counter steer the wheels of human development in the direction of more irrefutable nonsense here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Kirsten. Hey, Justin. How's it going over there in nice, warm Davis? It's been brilliant. Like I said, I got a motorcycle. <laughs> it's, I, what more could you want than to be in sunny California with a brand new motorcycle? It sounds blissful, but I do have to say I'm now both afraid for your own safety and for the safety of millions of Californians <laughs> on the roadways. <laughs> Terrified. But that's not what we're what we're here to talk about. We're here, <laughs> we're here to talk about science, right? We are. And today, as usual, so much science news. I mean, I was I was thinking about all the stories that were out there, and you know, I, I mostly went for stuff that uh, people suggested because they're suggested, so people are obviously interested. But there's so many stories out there. My goodness, it's crazy. So this week. I have stories about miracle tomatoes, an old piece of mantle, and a lot of blooming dust. What do you have, Justin? I have um, lots of stories about uh, sort of sci with psychological slants to them. I thought you were going to say sciatica. Sci I have sciatica. <laughs> like that, that too. Um, yeah, lots. Of, it's all. It seems to be all. I seem to be themed up with psychology this week. Well, that's good because I also, at the end of the hour, we have a few minion emails to respond to uh, to your comments from last week about psychology and advertising. Yeah. yeah and How I they've think, dominated American society and have created our value system for us. Right. So it'll there, be fun. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. And I think are there any are there any emails that are <laughs> that are countering my point of view? I'm I'm not gonna say anything yet. We will let people, you know, guess what's going to be at the end of the hour, what's what the what the minion mailbag will say. All right. All right. And this is just the beginning. Um there may, you know, could be that Next week, we will have more emails as well. So I'm just looking forward to hearing what people say over the next uh, week or so and, and, and enjoying the conversation. You may be pleasantly surprised. But moving into the top story. Oh, I was going to say, sorry, everyone. Allie's, not, Allie's out tonight, just in case you hadn't noticed. So uh, everyone say, hi, Allie. Bye, Allie. We'll see you next week. She'll be back next week. So top of the hour, the... The story that the m most people suggested to me this week, so that's kind of how the how I voted, how I chose this one by votes. The old old evidence of stone tool use, but no actual stone tools, but the evidence of their use pushes back the uh, the evidence of humans using implements and tools more than one million years. One million years. Wow. To the days of Lucy. So yeah. our um, 
our oldest ancestor, Lucy, an Australopithecus afarensis specimen, 3.4 million years ago may have been when we started using stone tools. And part of the, the, the question here is whether or not it was, they were stone tools that were created by the afarensis species, or whether they were stone tools that were just kind of rocks that were picked up that just happened to be handy that they used to carve up carcasses and, and get the meat off of bones to be able to eat that meat. Um, I the, think selection is the most impressive part of it, using a tool in the beginning stages anyway. Creating is a right. nice step to not having to go look for something, but it's not as, as uh, awesome a move as actually selecting something for its tool using ability. Yeah, and that, that you can kind of look at other places in the animal kingdom where, you know, animals aren't necessarily fashioning tools or creating things, but they're using sticks and twigs and rocks and things that they pick up in the environment around them to actually use them for a purpose. Mm. So I think that's, I think you're right. I think there's definitely that, that first stage of recognizing that you can use something in your environment for an actual function. Um, and so it's possible that Lucy and her, uh, her, her peers were carving up carcasses with rocks from the environment or maybe things that they carved themselves. And that's, that's really the question. There are people who are arguing the evidence and saying a million years, a million years passes and we didn't notice anything in the, in the fossil record. There are no tools anywhere else. Like the first, the first evidence, um, prior to this of tools are actual stone tools that were found with fossils about uh, 2.6 million years, um, 2.6 million years ago. And that, you know, that's a long time to have no tools show up, you know? Uh, so what was, uh, what was actually going on there? And so yes people are no. arguing. Yes or no, right? Because, because this is the ancient age where there wasn't uh, as stable a society. So a culture can exist that has tools, uses tools, dies out for some disease or famine or drought or some kind of situation. And the tool use and has to sort of build up again. We knew, we knew from the Greeks, the Greeks had proved that the earth was round, um, and yet <laughs> thousands of years passed before right. it was, you know, discovered by an Italian that, in fact, the earth was round again. So th this, that's not too unusual for technology. It's just, it seems like a million years is like a long time today. Yeah. From, you know, our, the, the way in which we acquire technology now happens so much quicker and doesn't get forgotten anymore. Right. And I, I think part of the question also is, you know, is it that this stuff is not just, it's just not there because yeah, they were just selecting stuff in the environment. And so, you know, when you're looking at a fossil dig site as an archeologist, maybe they're just not seeing it or just haven't seen the tools. Maybe the tools that they use, the rocks, whatever, they were kind of picked up and then tossed off somewhere else because why keep them in one place? They're just something there in the environment. Um, you know, so maybe they're just hard to find or, you know, or the other possibility is that it's just the, um, you know, is it, is it the archaeo archaeological record itself that's sparse or is it that they're just not there? I like, I like that. I like that if it's just selection, yeah, you can find it anywhere. You use it. You maybe even leave it at the site. Why carry it around? Right. If you actually had to craft something, you put work into it and effort into it, then you would hang on to it. It would stay with you and end up at the... Uh, the garbage site when it was used up or end up in the community where everybody lived. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. I love the, I love the, the kind of, you know, human, um, anthropological and also, also archeological side to this of like, what would people be doing? You know, they're not people developed like us and their brains probably didn't work the same way, but they're hominids, you know, an ancient, you know, an ancient ancestor, of, of our own. And so there are similarities, you know, can we look at chimpanzees and see some, see similarities to the afarensis species? Was there something or were, was afarensis more fully developed than chimpanzees? Just, I don't know, very interesting questions going on out there, but it could be that we're smarter than we thought we were. And we were using tools a million years earlier than previously. Yeah. Not. That's cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. What you got? Uh, let's see. What do I have? I may have a, uh, I may have a story here. A so how's the video quality tonight? 
<laughs> How's the video quality? It's great. Yeah, is it coming through? Because we have a not for those who aren't uh, watching live, we are on uh, twit.tv live on Thursdays at 7:30. Uh, but if you're if you are watching there, my video quality seems to seems to have this like ebb and flow. Like I'm looking now at the thing and I seem to be lip syncing myself, like a bad dubbing. Just don't right? just don't look at yourself. Don't look at but yourself if, in the eyes, Justin. <laughs> ah, oh, you're a handsome man. You are so beautiful. I would like to take you home. Oh, I already have. Okay. So now, well, this is a... So for our audience out there, though, it shouldn't really matter because video quality is apparently less important when you are enjoying what you're watching. This ah. is from Rice University's Department of Psychology that finds if you, uh, if you like what you're watching... You are less likely to notice the difference in video quality of a TV show versus an internet show or even just a mobile phone movie clip. Findings come from this recently released study, the effect of content desirability on subjective video quality ratings. It was authored by Philip Cordham, Rice Professor, Indie Practice, and Faculty Fellow. So the study uh, studies in the journal Human Factors right now. We're in, uh, quoting Cordham, research has been done asking if people can detect video quality differences. What we were looking at is how video quality affects viewers in a real way. So part of the impetus of this is we are now in an age where there is a sort of um, dollar amount that's going to be put on the quality of the, the images that you're getting. Whether you're getting it through a cable network or through an internet or through your phone, it costs for bandwidth. So they're, I think, trying to determine... How much of a difference does it make to the end consumer and how much can they tell actually if they're getting that high definition image or if they're getting a lower definition image and how is that going to affect how much they like the content? What was not really what they were looking for, but they were surprised to see is that the low quality movies were being rated higher in quality than some of the high quality videos. After we started analyzing the data, we determined what was driving the actual desirability of the content. And, believe it or not, it was the content that was important, not the quality in which it was delivered. So, according again here, if you're at home watching an enjoyable movie, we found that you're probably not going to notice or even concern yourself with how many pixels the video is or if the data is being compressed says Cordham again. Uh, the findings run counter to the popular belief that Americans are striving for and must have the best video quality at their fingertips all the time. So this is, you know, because this is, we grew up with with snow, which the kids oh, yeah. today ever going to know what snow is. <laughs> what is, <laughs> what's gonna, static? What's snow yeah, on a television? Gonna, right. I don't gonna get it. Once in a while stuff gets pixelated or it needs to buffer, which mm -hmm. would have just been weird for us if all of a sudden our show paused. What? a minute to start playing again it wouldn't have made any <laughs> sense like, so yeah somebody somebody advanced the projector um so yeah i guess this is what's really interesting though is this is gonna play into what happens in the future as there is more competition for bandwidth uh to deliver content it may be that we we start getting worse and worse content and those shows perhaps that are tracking as less desirable shows may actually get the best video quality. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> crap that you really don't want to watch will be delivered in the utmost high definition possible. And the shows you're really anxious to watch, they're going to compress the heck out of it because you're going to watch it anyway. Because you're going to watch it anyway. Yeah. And, yeah. That, may be, that may be the future that we're, uh, we're sliding yeah. towards. Yeah, well, the one thing is is true, and I know this from, from my own experience in putting stuff together and, um, and watching shows, and audio is incredibly more important than video. And so if you have, if you have bad audio content, people are much less willing to, to stand it. If it's the uh, and so it's the video that can kind of give a little bit, and you don't you don't have to have it be perfect. I mean, people do get annoyed maybe at the video not matching the audio, so that if like if they're off by a frame or two, and they the lips don't match the voice, and you you feel that like you're watching a, like yeah bad or somebody or, or somebody wearing a green shirt <laughs> with a red background. <laughs> I think it's that great. Could, it's like Christmas. It could also <laughs> cause a clash to the eyes. Yeah, only not for people who are colorblind, though. 
Yeah, but what's okay. amazing, what's amazing is if you ask somebody who's colorblind what, what color a stop sign is. They say red. Yeah. And so you learn it's red. That's that's what red you is. You learn it's red, but they're saying it's red as though it's really true that it's red. <laughs> but they don't really know that. They've never experienced it. They just have been told this. No, they so have they, their they have their own experience of red. So they have, you know, their shade of gray or perhaps Exactly. You Exactly. Is, right. That whatever it is that they see that is red. Right. And they learn what that is. You know, maybe they have a hard time with discriminating the fine gradations of color, but yeah, they got it. I think that's, I think it's very, very an interesting question. My red is not your red. Your red is not my red. They are different. So different. And then, and then, and then everybody can agree. Can everybody agree for a moment that a stop sign is red? Yes, because that is what they tell us. Right. Because we're told that. <laughs> but the other thing is though, it's then it's not true after a little while. After a little while, what is red isn't even true because then it's, you know, what number is it when you're like picking out the pixels to represent the color of a stop sign on an internet icon? You have to actually have a specific number and that number then represents what that color is, which is different from other things that we might call red. Right. And to an artist, it might be a crimson versus a candy apple or whatever else from the paints that they have to mix. So even then, there's no truth that red is red. Interesting. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and there's more. Our, our different. This was uh, actually at the, uh, what is the big science uh, exhibit thingy down there in San Francisco? The Cal the Academy old, or the Exploratorium? Exploratorium. Mm -hmm. They have uh, this color wheel and you're supposed to pick um, one color from this spot and one color from another spot and the two that match up. Mm -hmm. What's amazing, if somebody else is there, they're going to pick a different color. Yeah. And it's this really strange, uh, really strange physical experiment where you can actually see that we aren't all seeing the same color, that there oh, are differences. Cool. Yeah. That makes me want to go there. I want to go there. We have agreement. I we've uh, we've it. achieved an agreement to what to call things. But what we actually see is slightly is different. different. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Well, what we see on this planet is a bunch of rock. This planet is a bunch of rock. And scientists are looking at ancient, ancient rocks. In fact, they're looking at some rocks um, way up in, uh, I think it's the North, is it the North Pole? Where did they look? Where did they look? Let me see if I can find it in here. Um, Not a lot of rocks at the North Pole. In the Arctic <laughs> Circle. Here it is. The Arctic Circle, Canada's remote Baffin Island. They actually went to uh, a mountain called Mount Thor. Mount Thor is this really tall mountain, uh, about 5,500 feet in elevation, it just is this, it, it looks like it's just shot straight up out of the earth. It's an amazing, uh, it's an, an amazing looking uh, mountain. Anyway, this mountain was formed about 63 million years ago, but it was formed by magma pushing up out of the earth, out of the earth's uh, mantle. So the mantle is the area of the earth between the crust, which we are on, and the core, which is hot and molten and supposedly a lot of iron. That's what people think. Um, but the question, there's this question of what is the earth made of? What is the mantle made of? And is the, our planet's composition the same as you know, the sun's composition or other planets' composition. And there's this, this hypothesis that geologists have had for years that our primordial earth, when it was this hot mass of molten uh, material, was pretty much the same as what are, what are called chondrites. They're really old and very common meteorites in the solar system. So these chondrites have a, com a chemical composition that's made up of a, a a particular ratio of helium, lead, and neodymium isotopes. So these particular isotopes in particular uh, uh, amounts. And, and the chondrites have a sun-like ratio, so similar to what the sun has. And they're thinking, okay, well, we're going to think that the Earth is probably very similar to this as well. It was probably formed in the around the same period of time these chondrites were formed. But... Until now, we haven't really found any pieces of mantle that were old enough. I mean, when does the mantle come up? Well, not that often. How are we going to know that man the mantle is that old? Um, but the geologists actually found this 
this in this mountain on Baffin Island, they found that the rock, the original rock, and this is from um, io9's website, the original rock had melted about 62 million years ago when it came into contact with the magma and was then ejected from the mantle onto the island's surface in a burst of volcanic activity. So when the rock was melted by the magma, the magma took on the same, or the, uh, the rock takes on the isotopic composition. So the lava is a proxy for the original rock. So they wanted to check this. They checked it out. They dated the rocks, placing the formation of the original rocks that had melted in the magma that were then ejected at around 62, 63 million years ago. Um, they dated them at between 4.5 and 4.45 billion years ago. And they found that they did not have the same isotopic composition as the sun. So this chondrite mm. hypothesis isn't right. There's something else going on. And so they don't really know, you know, what the actual composition of the earth, earth's mantle is, what the, uh, how the earth would have possibly formed or, um, it doesn't seem to be the way that we thought it was. And so now uh, there's a research leader and I don't, I honestly, I've read this over and over again and I really am trying to figure out how this would work. But the research leader, Matthew Jackson, is suggesting that the earth might've gone through a traumatic geological event where its entire crust was extracted and buried deep underground. And then the ratios found in the original crust and the piece of mantle recovered on Bass Baffin Island would then add up to the traditional chondritic model. And so they just haven't found that. Yeah, so I don't know how this event would happen or why this event would happen, and they haven't really given a good explanation of that. So they're trying to say, well, you know, maybe there was something else that happened that uh, would explain it and make our hypothesis actually right after all, even though it doesn't seem to be. <laughs> <laughs> which i think is kind of funny but anyway i think it's you know it's it's amazing that it's so hard to find rock you know because our earth formed 4.5 more than 4.5 billion years ago so it was hot it was molten when it was forming i mean it wasn't just a sudden it wasn't just a solid piece of rock right so where do you find the rocks? How do you know what that what the co original composition was? And it's just interesting that they're um, you know having such a hard time figuring it out, but they're working on it. Yeah, no, it is, it is tough because yeah, the crust keeps melting back into the inner core like right. over and over and over and over again. So that <laughs> it's we're always working on a new planet. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you're right. Tell me a story. Anyone who's listening, you're, you're listening to uh, This Week in Science. Somebody is asking if a massive impact is how we got the moon. Maybe. That's what people think. People think mm. that uh, researchers think there was a giant impact that shoved a wad of material out, ejected it from the Earth and created the moon. It was captured by the, by the Earth's gravitational field. That's maybe. The, that's the idea. Maybe. What do you, I don't know. I don't know. It's what, a maybe. It's, you know, we weren't there. You don't know. We weren't there. No, but where would it come from? And it, well, I believe it, that moon rocks have a very have, similar composition to Earth. I think that's, I think that's been shown. Okay. I don't think that's weird if they developed around the same time that we did and got just didn't get sucked up into the earth when the earth formed and, you know, maybe formed over there. But it's okay. Yeah, it's all right. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure it out. There's time. We got to go Tell there. me we a story. Tell me a story. Tell samples. me a story. Tell me, me a story. Figuring. Tell me a story. Next time you're having a bad day at work, tribulations with the one that you love or are simply suffering a cruel social injustice, science may have discovered a pill that you can pop to get over it. What's more, this pill may already be in your medicine cabinet. This is exciting news. Uh, University of Florida researcher says acetaminophen, an ingredient in the popular over-the-counter pain relievers, uh, may also relieve the pain from hurt feelings. The findings suggest, for the first time, that emotional and physical pain 
are interrelated, says uh, Gregory Webster, a UF psychologist who co-authored the study with a team of researchers. We think that social pain piggybacks onto the physical pain, and the two systems sort of bleed into each other. So, that, so just as you feel emotional distress from physical pain, the social pain of having a romance breakup or getting a horrible grade, I don't think that would cause me pain, horrible grade, can translate into feeling sick to your stomach or getting a bad headache. In the study uh, published in the Psychological Science and available to online, people who took acetaminophen daily for three weeks reported less emotional suffering over time and showed less activity in regions of the brain previously known to respond to social rejection than those who took the placebo. Even so, Webster says, we don't want people we don't want to tell people to go take Tylenol to cope with their personal problems until <laughs> until <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so here's the quote. Even so, even based on this first study, <laughs> We don't want to tell people to go take Tylenol to cope with their personal problems until more research is done. Right. More research. And then, and then, then we'll tell you to take a pill. Take a pill. And not suffer yeah. even the slightest tribulation. Yeah. So they, have a Tylenol. <laughs> it's just, it's so wrong. The findings have the uh, potential for acetaminophen to be used eventually to treat minor social pains instead of the more powerful drugs that are being used today, says Webster. Uh, acetaminophen may also show promise in curtailing antisocial behaviors. What? <sighs> I guess if I don't have a headache, I'm more likely to want to talk to people. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. I don't. Because research uh, has found that being rejected <laughs> triggers aggression. Using acetaminophen to alleviate the emotional distress of being rejected could reduce the likelihood of a destructive reaction. Wow, it's the wonder drug. It really <laughs> is. is. Who knew? I just, I just love I mean, people have been taking it for uh, anti-inflammatory stuff for years. Who uh, knew? The reason, the reason people are maladjusted in society is because... They they don't fit in. They 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 take offense at rejection. If people stop being offended or hurt by rejection, uh, not fitting in, then they wouldn't be aggressive towards those of us who do fit in perfectly well to the society that we've decided what's maladjusted and isn't. It's insane. Study part, uh, participants received functional magnetic resonance imaging during a computerized game of Cyberball, which simulated uh, social rejection basically... Each participant uh, was passing the ball to one of the computerized images of other people who were also online passing the ball. And then one of the participants suddenly would be excluded from the exchange. As you're out. Pass back and forth. There's a little, little game of, of uh, virtual keep away. Oh, my gosh. We're not given a reason for this. Just all of a sudden, you're out. <laughs> um, and how does that so make you feel? And what if we give you Tylenol for it? Right. So it gave them the feeling of ost being ostracized. Uh, by random as assignment, nearly half the participants, 24 women, 6 men, took a 500 milligram pill of acetaminophen immediately after waking up each day and another 500 milligram pill one hour before going to sleep. Uh, while the uh, an equally divided 24 women, 8 men, took a placebo. Each night, uh, the participants filled out a survey to assess their level of hurt feelings during the day. Throughout the three weeks, those who took acetaminophen reported significantly fewer hurt feelings on average than participants in the placebo group. In addition, they showed much less activity in the areas of the brain linked with emotional feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Such as hurt and rejection, but they were just... They, they were numb, automata. <laughs> Apathetic. I didn't feel... I feel nothing. Don't care. <laughs> I am You're a nihilist. Yeah. yeah, it is meaningless to me. <laughs> the connection of mind and body to the extent that pain in one sphere can be transferred at least indirectly to another may have provided an evolutionary edge to our ancestors, uh, so says the uh, Webster here. Because humans so have... say we all. <laughs> well, this is, he says we have an extended infancy... Compared with other animals. So we are unable to defend or feed ourselves longer while we are still developing social connections from that early age. So it may be crucial 
to have this implemented. As a result, human social attachment system may have developed by piggybacking onto the physical pain system and becoming an outgrowth in order to promote survival. Our findings have important implications because, because social exclusion is such a common part of life. People can feel ostracized at work, snubbed by friends, excluded by their partners, or slighted by, in any number of situations. Feel snubbed What's by it? friends? Feel excluded by partners? There's something you can do. You can feel better now. Take Tylenol. Yeah, but here's the, <laughs> here's the interesting backlash. Not just that, for headaches anymore. Here's the interesting backlash that this could have. <sighs> here's the next study. Here's the study I want to see now, okay? You have the placebo group and the not placebo group taking the acetaminophen. And you ply them with commercials, uh, prompting them to fulfill a desire by buying a product. And I'd like to see if the folks who take a lot of acetaminophen are more resistant to advertising. That would be. A mm, you're tying it into the advertising again. I see. Yes, because this is the well. This is the foundation of all of all Western. Well, if, you're not, if you're not feeling social re rejection, if you don't, because if the advertising is supposed to make you feel left out and you want to opt in because you have to buy the stuff so you can be like everybody else and you're not left out. Yeah, maybe, but then you're falling into it because you're buying Tylenol in the first place and that was advertised to you. Right, because that would keep you from hurt. falling for advertising. It's the cure for <laughs> advertising. <laughs> Buy it now. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There's a miracle tomato out there. Miracle tomato. Well, some people might call it a miracle. But what it does... Researchers in Tokyo have created a transgene tomato. Justin, do you realize you make noise every time you do that? He does not. Researchers in Japan have created a transgene tomato that contains or churns out a compound known as miraculin. And those of you uh, in the audience in the, in the know might uh, recognize that as the special compound that allows sour fruits or bitter foods to taste sweet. Miracle fruit has been commonly used in Japan as a diet uh, aid for years. It's become more popular in the United States over the last, last few years with people having miracle fruit tasting parties. And the, the fruit of the miracle fruit you just chew on it and it affects the receptors in your tongue, in your mouth, for the bitter taste, allowing you to then taste sweet things. So a lemon tastes like lemonade, a pickle tastes, a sour pickle, dill pickle tastes like a sweet pickle, uh, you name it, the flavors change. And so uh, in Japan, this has been a huge thing in the diet industry with people wanting, with people eating it so that they can eat low calorie foods that are normally kind of bitter, but actually feel like they're eating sweet desserts and are getting something that's actually really, you know, special for them. And so now these researchers led by Kazuhisa Kato, Hiroshi, Hiroshi Izura and Tsuyoshi Mizoguchi, they've uh, engineered these tomatoes that, that, that can be grown indoors for mass rearing indoors in factory like settings so that quote unquote, Plant managers could coddle their plants, limit any risk of infestations or blights, and prevent their genetically engineered tomatoes from inadvertently sharing the genes with wild plants, which we don't really want to happen. And, oh, by the way, uh, evidence of the first genetically engineered plant in the wild has actually been found and reported this week. So, hey, they're getting out there anyway. Um, but this little t tomato offers about yields about 73 and a half kilograms per square meter of the miraculin. It's very rich. And if you eat one of the little tomatoes, it's very similar to the miracle fruits, berry protein. So who knows, have a little salad with these little cherry tomatoes and uh, suddenly everything is different. This is actually a cherry tomato I grew. <laughs> Really? It's a miracle cherry tomato. It looks like a giant red balloon. Stream, stream, it's much bigger than my head. 
Is yeah. it, it's like a uh, weather balloon. You know what the tomatoes like? You know what they love? Heat. Again, this really is a cherry tomato. Uh, no, they do. They don't mind the heat, but you know what they love? Coffee. Coffee. If you make coffee and you got the leftover coffee and the coffee grounds, put mm. that on your tomato plants. They oh. love it. Maybe the bugs just don't like coffee. I don't know. Anyway, it's, uh, I, I think no, it's, it's not an infestation thing. It uh, does something with the alkalines. The alkalines. Or something. Right. Something with the chemistry. Or they, maybe it's the caffeine. Maybe they just get pumped. Yeah. Well, I think we're about out of time for the first half of the show. I think we've been running for about a half hour now. So right. I think it's about time to take a little short break. So uh, I think we'll be back in just a few minutes. <laughs> thing to expect us when homo turns erect us would be the use of tools and next comes prejudice and the next thing I think we'll see with increased mental capacity would be the use of laws and decrees designed Take freedoms away from you and me We got a world to kill We got a mind to fill Where there's will, I guess there's way There's not much else to say So everyone out there, hey, if you just watched Justin, he ran off. You maybe should take a quick break and go run outside yourself if you're listening to this podcast right now. Uh, there's meteors to see. The Perseids are hitting their peak tonight. So if it's dark where you are, you might want to and clear. That's a big that's a big part of the issue. Part of the story. Yeah. You have to be able to see past the haze and the fog and the clouds <gasps> to the sky out beyond. Yes. The Perseids. Yes, that wonderful comet that we pass through, the tail of which we pass through every year around this time for a great, great meteor shower is peaking right now. Right now. I know England has already seen seen the, the night's meteors, but, you know, here, uh, maybe on the East Coast, maybe it's almost time. Maybe when you're done watching this show, head on outside and go take a look at the meteors. It's time. Um, also... I got an email from Monty Harper, who I, uh, we talked about his Kickstarter project briefly last week and put a link on the Twist website. He wrote me to say that he's actually heading into the last week of his campaign. He's at 65% funded right now with pledges steadily trickling in only $3,125 left to go. He's very optimistic. He's hoping that he'll get there. And Saturday, August 21st is the last day of his campaign to create an awesome science music CD. He's going to be broadcasting live video all day on the 21st so people can follow along and see if and when he reaches his goal. And he's going to be doing a lot of fun stuff with that. He says it's also his birthday on the 21st, so it's going to be a birthday bash slash fundraising vigil. So if you're interested, you can maybe check it out at montyharper.com. And for those of you who, you know, this is your first time hearing about it, Monty Harper is trying to make a science CD full of awesome music, well-produced and just terrific and fantastic for people all over to listen to and learn more about the wonders of science. And you could be a part of making that happen if you just donate to his Kickstarter project. And we'll put that link on the, on the webpage again. I don't have much else to say, but Justin's not back yet, is he? Oh, is he back? There he is. He changed his shirt. He did. Before we go back with the music, hey, Justin... Yeah. Oh, you, you turned him down. Um, every time you get up and leave, you move the microphone and it makes this terrible noise. And it's like... What's it sound like? It's a, like what? Something That's like... It's kind of groovy. No, it's not so, it's not so um, rhythmic. <laughs> not so rhythmic. Is, does anybody know, has my video quality decreased? No. I think I'm get, it's getting worse. I think you're paranoid. You're fine. Oh, okay. All right. You're I believe fine. you. You're fine. Yeah. Just so, fishing for 
So it, maybe if comments. you're go if you're going to um, take off your headset, please mute the headset before you take it off and run away. Word. That would be awesome. Awesome. Okay, now we're ready to come back from the break. I think. <laughs> Back to something. When do I get to rant? To gloat or not, we'll see if we need more of you and me. The overpopulation just happens to be the last thing I think we need. Science is a double-edged blade at best Oh, I embrace it, not one to protest When a computer beats a master at chess, I guess You'd better wonder what comes next Oh, we got a world to kill We got a mind to fill Where there's will, I guess Hey, we're back. This is This Week in Science. Justin, did you have any stories? Yeah. Yeah. I have angry people. Oh, no. I don't like <laughs> No. <Yes. laughs> That's not what I want. Okay. I have angry people who like positive things. Oh, angry mob who like teddy bears. No, this isn't a mob okay. thing. This is this is uh, another trigger that's going to get used by our uh, consumer overlords soon. Anger has been long considered to be a negative emotion. But uh, just like happy or excited feelings, uh, feeling angry can make people want to seek a reward, according to a new study of emotion and visual attention. The researchers found that people who are angry pay more attention to rewards than to threats. The opposite result was found of people experiencing other negative emotions, such as fear. So... Previous uh, research has shown that emotion itself can affect what somebody pays attention to. And uh, these are experiments where they lull you into one of these emotional states and then show you lots of images and they have a thing that watches your eye movements between two images. So they'll have a dreary kind of image on one side and a very positive sort of image on the other. And they'll track which one you pay more attention to. So if you're scared or frightful in the, in the, the mood that they've set, you tend to look at the more frightening, threatening image, like somebody with a knife or something like that. Uh, whereas if you've been prepped to have a positive or excited, happy emotion, you'll be looking at the puppy <laughs> that's running through the field of wildflowers as opposed to the man wielding the axe. So that's, a, that's sort of what this, these are all based on. If a fearful or anxious person is giving a choice of the rewarding picture, like a sex, sexy couple or a threatening per, picture like a person with a knife, uh, they spend more time looking at the rewarding picture. But, uh, yeah, apparently the angry people, people who are PO'd about something or another, go for the more positive-looking image. So nobody knows whether these reactions occur because the emotions are positive or negative or it's something else, says Brett Ford of Boston College, who wrote the study with uh, colleagues. Uh, for example, emotions can vary in what they make us want to do. Fear is associated with the motivation to avoid something, whereas excitement is associated with the motivation to approach. It can make you want to seek certain things or avoid certain things, uh, respectively. So the research is published here in Psychological Science, which could also be, you know, <laughs> consumers or uh, uh, this sort of selling <laughs> strategy. <laughs> right, or, right. Or consumers. First study, Ford focused on anger. Like anger, or like fear, anger is considered a negative emotion. But like excitement, anger motivates somebody to go out and do something. And in this case, they found that it actually gets you to seek reward. First participants in the study were assigned to write for 15 minutes about one of uh, four memories in their past. A time when they were angry, afraid, excited, or happy. So this is the where they lulled them into the emotional state. A five-minute piece of music reinforced whatever emotion the participant had been assigned. They then completed a task in which they had to examine the two side-by-side -side pictures with the eye-tracking device monitoring how much time they spent looking at each picture. Angry people spent more time looking at the rewarding pictures, which uh, suggests that this is a kind of visual attention bias, and it is related to how an emotion motivates somebody 
more to how it motivates somebody than to whether it's positive or negative. Looking at something is the first step before the thoughts and actions that follow. You catch that? Uh, looking at something is the first step before the thoughts and actions that follow. So whatever you see, sort of uh, whatever images you're looking at pre uh, precipitates the thought, which then precipitates the action that might come afterwards. This is, of course, the core of all advertising in visual mm. form. Uh, so, so, people, so people are like checking out the more positive images. The angry people are spending more time checking out the right. positive images. So from that, you would guess, and, you would hypothesize that the next action would be something to make themselves less angry. Well, perhaps or perhaps not. But uh, the attention kicks off an entire stream of events that can end up influencing behavior. People who felt happy and excited also looked at the more rewarding photos, but the two groups might act completely differently. An angry person might be motivated to approach something in a confrontational or aggressive way, while a happy person might go for something they want in a more collaborative or socially friendly way. So it may be... It, it, it may be that the, the angry people are still seeking the same reward, desired reward as the happy people, but the way that they approach it aggressively might determine what their behavior is, might determine how that, how things end, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of, I can sort of picture like if my kids are, are angry or happy, they might, um, you know, and there's like ice cream to be had or, or some sort of reward or treat. If they're really angry, they might just demand it, you know, right. give it to me versus if they're already in a good mood. It's like, oh, yeah, I can wait till it's in the bowl. And when it's time to have a treat, totally, you know, mm -hmm. I can see them being their reaction being different to the reward. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I wonder. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I could just imagine, you know, if you're angry or upset about something and you look at something that's a positive reinforcing uh, image, a, re a potential reward but you're just angry, and so you're just angrier. you're just thinking angry <laughs> thoughts. You're just like, oh, those darned nice people. What do they have to be so happy about? You know, <laughs> in your head, you're just cursing and <laughs> getting angrier. Yeah, yeah, no good. I don't know. Interesting. It's an it's an interesting discovery. Interesting. Where do we put our attention, and what does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, news, quick news. Is there a super bug on the way? We don't want super oh, bugs. Yeah. Another one? Yeah, another Where from one. this time? Uh, from India or Southeast Asia. It turns out that a bunch of, there were about 37 people who returned from uh, <laughs> going on a tourist surgery, surgery tourism trips. Yeah, becoming um, very popular in America these days. Yeah, most America are going to South <laughs> Go to America the third world or Russia. Country yeah. It's got cheaper, uh, cheaper surgery rates to get your work done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very popular. So these people who returned after going to India or Pakistan to get plastic surgery done, uh, they, or I guess, I don't know if it's plastic surgery, after undergoing surgery in those countries, they came back and they found, the researchers found a gene in the bacteria that these people had, that so they were infected with, these bacteria have a specialized gene that researchers are calling NDM1 that is, it makes them completely resistant to nearly all known antibiotics. Wait a second. They got back into their country of origin? Yeah. Pandemic! <laughs> it's a pandemic! It's not, but it's... Sound the alarm, ring the bell, <laughs> hit the red button. It's a pandemic! Yeah, it's multiple countries. Peoples. Oh, no, we're all going to die. Shh. Panic. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. <sighs> it's not crazy yet, but this article was published in Lancet Infectious Diseases. And the question now is, you know, is this going to be something that's going to be more prevalent? This gene is easily transferred from, you know, whatever bacteria it was harbored in, in uh, these countries. So in uh, South Asia, in these South Asian countries, um, whatever bacteria had it is able to pass it on very easily through plasmids, which is a form of um of gene transfer. There's this plasmid gene transfer that occurs in bacteria. It's pretty really common. Bacteria are always like, hey, want a pack of cards? Hey, here's, here's a pack of cards. 
just steal them in. And, um, and so this particular gene might be particularly nasty, but, uh, so 37 people, that's a pretty large number. Um, and so the question now is what can be done to reduce this? This isn't probably isn't the first instance of this happening. This is just the first instance of researchers looking for it and knowing what to look for. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's worrying and it's definitely something that researchers are going to be, you know, kind of peeking at. Quarantine and, them. Yeah. Well, these people Kill definitely, them. definitely will have to be cleaned, cleansed, quarantined before they're let back can't, in the population. Can't clean them. But the, or, or, oh, you mean like ethnic cleansing? No. <laughs> that kind of cleaning. <laughs> Bacterial <laughs> cleansing, maybe. <laughs> no, um, but the the question is, you know, can we can we reduce surgical tourism? Can we can we get people to you know stop doing that because it's you know even more likely to be passing bugs like this around and genes from bugs around no, that could cause a bunch of problems. It's just the, uh, it's the global flattening of the economic <laughs> scale. That's all it is. Global it's, it's on a flattening. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's give the me, flattening of the earth. Yeah. Give me another story. Make it quick. I like that one. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, Einstein at home uh, found something really cool. Uh, what else is there? Um, they, they, <laughs> we talked about the uh, fold it. Yeah. How they did some uh, really groovy folding ones. Some, this is uh, what is what did they find? My goodness! A uh, oh, a new radio pulsar that was hidden in uh, data gathered by the uh, Arecibo Observatory. Oh, cool! Was discovered by Einstein at home, which is a uh, system that uses idle computers of some quarter million volunteers from 192 different countries. Do we have 192 countries now? <laughs> Are these all on Earth? It's the uh, first genuine astronomical discovery by a public volunteer distributed computing project. Cool. Mm. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah, Einstein at home. I don't even, I don't see it on here when this started. I remember we talked about it on the show years ago, many years ago. Maybe it's uh, you know, developed uh, in 2005. Yeah, that's not that long and, for it to be analyzing right, and data. And basically it lets... You download a program, Einstein at home. It works in the background when you're not using the processing uh, capabilities of your computer. And it crunches data coming in from observatories around the world and looks for patterns of things just like this. And now it actually has a discovery. That's awesome. Yay. Radio Pulsar. Yay, Einstein Sweet. at home. Um, one quick, more, one more. Quick last story. The, I, I have a story, too. Oh. I'm going to go really fast. So um, Af we all know that uh, Africa has um, broad, dusty deserts. And it turns out there's an area, a basin in um, a once massive lake in Chad. It's called the Baudelaire Depression. And it is uh, thought to be the dustiest place on Earth, or so reports Nature News. Um Bo Baudelaire, in, scientists went to Baudelaire in 2005 and wanted to know where does the dust go? There's all this dust. What does it do and where does it go? Turns out that it travels across the oceans to, um, it, it travels long, long distance. So from the Sandy Sahara, this dust in particular ends up traveling um, to the Amazon. Uh, so to the Amazon, where actually now researchers looked at the dust that they collected and they went back and they said, oh, let's take a look at the chemistry of this, figure out how it's composed. And it turns out that the nutrients that are in it, because it's an old lake bed, it actually has nutrients in the dust, the fine dust. This dust may actually be keeping the Amazon alive. It could be this dust that is compensating for the... Um, the nutrient poor rainforest soil. So the dust comes across the ocean to the Amazon where it is laid down and potentially adds to the soils and um, covers the plants in a way that can be used by them and utilized. Uh, what they think is that this, uh, how, when do they think it's going to go away? They think they have about a thousand years left in the dust. So maybe the Amazon has about a thousand years left before the dust gives up and it stops helping out the Amazon. Hmm. 
So let's try and be around in a thousand years to see if the Amazon is still here. <laughs> what was your last story? Oh, Make it a headline. Oh, uh, so yeah. This just in, people with extremely strong ties to their countries or groups are not only willing, but eager to sacrifice themselves to save their compatriots, according to new psychology research at the University of Texas at Austin. This is one of those things that, like, if we didn't already know, now we have science that says it's so and probably put some Latin words to it. So it must be true. But uh, fused, these are people who, uh, who have completely immersed themselves in their identifying themselves with their group, whether it's ethnic, national, or political, whatever, it doesn't really matter. These fused members believe that through suicide, their lives will achieve tremendous significance. Their strong sense of moral agency drives them to see not only that justice is done, but to also take an active role in its implementation. People who are identified uh, as having this, this emerged, this fused emergence uh, immersion with their group, 75% are willing to jump to their deaths to save the lives of five other group members, compared to only 25% of participants who are not so inclined or so in, uh, immersed. 88% said they would save five members of an extended uh, in-group, uh, but not members of an out-group. So they would they would do this. 88% said, 88 said they would die for one of their own, but definitely not for one of the others, whoever those others may be. Uh, they used a lot of examples there. When the option was, uh, when the option to push aside a fellow group member who was about to sacrifice himself to kill some escaped terrorists, 63% said they would push the group member aside so they themselves could leap to their deaths to divert a train that would then kill the terrorists, blah, blah, blah. So psychology drilling down on just how patriotism or group immersion can be a trigger for, <laughs> for uh, people to commit themselves to the very bitter end in support of... For the of good of the group. Whatever. It's for the whatever good of... The, 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 group the group is... Yeah, the group is bigger than themselves. In. Yeah. Whatever yeah. the group is, be it ethnic or be it national, yeah. be it your block All right, that you live so on. Moving into the Minion mailbag. We have to get on so that we can get through this. Um, last week, Justin, we mentioned earlier in the show that Justin had made some comments about um, advertising and psychology. Um, so here are some responses from a few people. Magnus Volset says, Long time listener, first time ever giving feedback, emailing you in regards to Justin's comments on the historical influences of psychology and psychoanalysis in organizing U.S. society. I do not believe the story is well known among the public nor practitioners, but as far as I know the literature, his claims are not especially controversial among historians. The four-part BBC documentary, The Century of Self of the Self, from 2002, gives you a brief but good introduction to the issue. However, as today's education in psychology and psychiatry does not spend nearly enough time on history, I would suggest contacting historians of psychology or psychiatry if you want more nuanced and informed opinions on this and other historical matters. matters. Um, additionally, uh, Adam wrote in to say, after listening to your podcast, I thought you might be interest, interested in Edward Bernays, apparently responsible for bringing the full breakfast to the U.S. and also, also helping tobacco companies to sell more cigarettes in the United States. I would say marketing has had and still plays a big role in U.S. culture, which also affects the rest of the world. And finally... Bernays, Bernays, is also, Bernays was also happens to be Freud's nephew. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and... And he also um, was the first person to come up with uh, the word public relations. That's right. That's that what you said last week. Yeah. Yeah. He said he wanted he wanted a, he wanted to use propaganda in peacetime to achieve things, but didn't want to call it propaganda. So he came up with public relations. He's also invented uh, product placement in the movies. That was his. <laughs> nice. So this is the last email, and he said this is from Carl Astrom. I don't know. I have a hard time with the umlauts. Sorry. Much as it pains me to defend Justin for once, I'd have to say <laughs> he's pretty much spot on. Public relations was basically created by Edward Bernays as a way of continuing propaganda in peacetime under a less stigmatized moniker. I'd suggest taking a look at the documentary Century of the Self by Adam Cur Curtis, 
which, while unfortunately slightly depressing and paranoid, gives an interesting picture of the growth and spread of psychotherapy psychotherapy and the control of public opinion during the 20th century. And so uh, these three people separately um, all suggested the same thing, basically, the century of self, of the self, and Edward Bernays. And there are links uh, from these emails that I'll put on the website for people who are interested in delving in delving into this a little bit more for, fully. Um, I just I thought it was interesting that the that all the responses that we got so far uh, on this topic, everyone agrees with you and everyone is citing the same, uh, the same right. basis. Here's, so here's, here's, where, here's where it came to me. Here's where it first came to me. It came to me as a child and I didn't, I didn't actually have it defined. I didn't actually know what it was, but I noticed something interesting about my Saturday morning cartoons. And if you're not 30, whatever old I am, used to be in America Saturday mornings for like four hours, five hours, there was nothing but cartoons. And that's when you would get up really early and you'd sit in front of the television for all four or five hours to watch all the cartoons that you could possibly watch for the whole week. And every week there was this pattern of the cereal commercials that they would show at every commercial break. There'd be these cereal commercials. And they all had a cartoon uh, logo character that was guiding you through it. One was um, a rabbit. And this rabbit... Uh, this rabbit wanted to get the cereal, but uh, the kids who were also cartoon characters would deny the rabbit the cereal. And the, the rabbit would try really hard, but in the end would always Tricks get are denied. Tricks for kids. The Silly rabbit. Silly and rabbit. The other one was a little bird that uh, didn't want the cereal, would go to the ends of the earth trying to escape the cereal. And the children would manipulate this little bird into eating the cereal. Going cuckoo then for the cocoa, cocoa for puffs. cocoa puffs cuckoo for cocoa puffs and then puffs. there was the there was the little leprechaun mm. who was determined not to let the children <sighs> have the cereal That's and right. by the end of each commercial the kids would have taken the cereal away from the little leprechaun all this just i noticed as a child they'd all had their territory and it was like they couldn't go into the other one's territory it was like but as an adult i think i realized what they were doing or i was a parent i suppose um one of the things children uh, have to endure as being a child is being powerless. They don't have the power to choose when to give themselves a reward. They don't have the power to deny a reward to anybody else. And they don't really manipulate others as much as they're manipulated by older people into getting, to do th uh, getting them to do things that they don't want to. So each of these commercials had staked the ground in the desires and the, the, the things that the children constantly are encountering. One is... They allowed the children in the commercial to empower by uh, to manipulate and to to give reward to to one of the cartoon characters. Uh, in one, they were the denier of reward. They got to be the adult and deny a reward to one of the cartoon characters. And one of the cartoon characters who was denying them the reward, they got to say, "Hey, no, we get to force the reward because we want it." Powerful drivers in child psychology, driving them to these cereals to fulfill these just absolute psychological desires that they face every day. And when they get there, they are rewarded. They get sugar, which kids enjoy. So they get a reward that has nothing to do with the desire that brought them to this cereal, but they do get rewarded with sugar, which is triggers all sorts of other reward things. And Happiness. that to me is <laughs> the most clear example of psychology being utilized uh, in, towards you know towards all of us but specifically children which i think now is illegal i think now if you have a degree in child psychology as of about of about i think four or five years ago it became illegal for you to consult with an advertising firm but damage has been done it's been going on for 50 years it's already right. they already have the manual they already have the, the breakdown of child psychology figured out they actually don't need consultants anymore so the really insidious thing is they're tapping into the psychological desires of a child, but mm -hmm. that's just, the, that one's obvious. As we become adults, it's still taking place. Everything is tailored to one of these desires we have. The reward we get has nothing to do with that desire. Right. It has no correlation. It used to be, if you look before Bernays, if you look before Freudian psychology and psychotherapy, psychotherapy became the, the focus group, the group sessions where they you know, ask a lot of people's opinions about a product. They don't care what they think about it. They want to know what they feel about products. Right. That transformation from before then in the 40s, when they would try to excite you about a product by addressing your need critically, like 
You want clean clothes? Everybody wants clean clothes. You can get clean clothes with Solarium. You know, blah, blah, blah. They would say their product is the best, the newest, the greatest to address that specific need that right. you had. And maybe they're trying to create that need, but it's direct with this is what you desire. This is the product that fulfills that need, that right. requirement. Here's your need. Here we got what you want. Yeah. Completely away from need. And psychology has been utilized to focus on on our desires that have nothing to do with the product that right. they sell. And what's really Fear, frightening is... <laughs> anger. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really frightening is that this is how our politics works now. Our politics has nothing to do with rationality. It has nothing to do no. with here's the need, here's here's the thing to address it. It's also now based on the word, the fulfilling needs that have nothing to do with the product. And at some point, we if we're consuming now politics... An ideology. What what all else is there? What's what's left but these desires that have nothing to do with what we're handed? So in, in the end, we end up living a fantasy living in a fantasy world thanks to psychology hacking the brain. And there There's you have a, it. There is folks. an upside to this. There is an upside. But, <laughs> yeah. All we're gonna have our to... inner desires can't be fulfilled by a product. <laughs> so, you know in, in millennia past we were denied fulfillment of our inner desires throughout all the millennia. Now we get our inner desires fulfilled. Has nothing to do with the actual desire, but they, they get fulfilled. We get pacif uh, pacified. The public gets controlled, and I think that's what's most important. <laughs> I'm glad that you, we, know, we now know what you think is most important, control of the public. <laughs> <laughs> Everything gonna... is under control. control. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it's it's it, when you start thinking about it, it's it's fascinating and terrifying. And, no, no, uh, don't think, don't think, Kirsten. It upsets everything. It's too bad. It's feel too late. Feel about it. It's too late. Just feel about it. Sorry. Don't think. Feel about it. No, what do you sorry. feel about sorry, it? Sorry, sorry, Justin. Too late. Matter. Are you? I'm a thinker. I, I do that. <laughs> I think. I'm a thinker. Sorry. You think you? But why do you? Why do you feel like it's important to think? Oh, man. Let's just move on. I think it's time for the end of the show. It's time to end this now. We'll see if we get any more emails on this next week. Um, in the meantime, we will be back here next week. Hopefully, Allie will be back, be back with us, too, um, bringing more science news. I'd love to thank everyone who sent in stories this week. Ed Dyer, David Eckerd, Gord McLeod, Jess Mason, um, Monkey... Uh, I'm losing my voice. I'm trying to think of who else sent stuff in. Thank you so much for sending in stories. They were great help this week and very interesting. And uh, anyone else out there, send in stories. We love it. We love it. Yeah, we uh, thank you for joining the show. We are also available via podcast. You can just Google us in the iTunes. Look for This Week in Science. You'll find us there. Uh, you can also email us, Kirsten at This Week in Science. Justin at This Week in Science, and be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in that subject line, or you will be spam filtered into oblivion. Wow, oblivion. We also have an Android um, app for this show. If you want to catch us on your mobile device that happens to run Android, search for twist for droid in the marketplace. If you just look for twist, it won't find us, unfortunately. You can look for This Week in Science or twist for number four droid. In oh, yeah. And for those of you who haven't found us live, uh, we are live Thursday nights at 7.30 on the twit.tv internet interwebs. You can, there's a video. And you can go to irc.twit.tv and you can actually interact with us with a chat room that is going on as the show is live. That's right. And for more information on anything else that you've heard here today, we will have show notes on the website. And our website is twis.org twist.org and it's dark it's dark outside there should be meteors there should all be over meteors. the place go out it's the persidium this is this is the night yes you can also contact us on twitter at dr kiki or at jackson fly uh just let us know if there if there's stories out there that that we should cover suggestions for interviews just questions comments about the show we'd love to get that stuff from you so send it on in and we'll be back here next week, and we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. But if you learned anything from tonight's show, remember... It's all in your head. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I wanna know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. 
Wow. Wow. That's right. I love that song. It just makes me so happy every time I hear it. So happy. Yeah. So happy.